Hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming along to this uh, webinar that's being hosted by the Socioeconomic Inequalities SIG, uh, part of ISPMPAR. Uh, so today we have Alex McMillan presenting from the University of Otago. And Alex McMillan is a senior lecturer in environmental health. She trained in medicine and is a public health physician. Her research focuses on the links between urban environments, sustainability and health. And her main interests are in translating evidence about sustainability and health into policy by bringing together policy, community, and academic knowledge and modeling future policy options. Um, and I saw Alex give a, a very similar talk recently. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh, this would be perfect as a webinar for the socioeconomic inequality SIG, because uh, it gives a great example of um, researchers really working with the community in what I think is a really productive way. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Anya, and thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you. It's really great. Um, so, as Anya said, I've got a really strong interest in where um, health and environmental sustainability and social justice meet. So, health equity and social equity meet. And I'm really interested in methods which are transdisciplinary, in other words, bringing community and policy and academic knowledge together for, for um, action and policy change. Um, and that's especially in cities, uh, because cities have to change, they need to change quite rapidly, um, especially to respond to, um, to climate change, uh, but also to respond to other public health crises like obesity and physical inactivity, those things that you're interest, interested in. Um, and those changes are going to require people to change how they live, uh, but it, that's not going to work unless people are involved in, in uh, making the decisions around those changes. Um, and also it's, it's true that if we're going to optimise health and equity and environmental sustainability to, together, then in making those changes, we can't just rely on um, technology, things like e-vehicles and autonomous vehicles to, to um, address climate change. Um, but rather we need to do um, participatory, policy-oriented um, research to understand how existing ways of doing things might be made better to, um, to make the change that's, that's needed. Um, and we also need to acknowledge that we're in changing cities to improve health and fairness and sustainability, um, that much of the urban infrastructure that's already there is still going to be there in another 50 to 100 years. So our urban infrastructure, that means the houses and the uh, built environment, the roads, the parks, all have a really long life. And that means learning how to um, not just build new things, but how to retrofit what's already there, especially in the suburbs of cities um, to, to make the shift that's needed. And all of those ideas underpin this, this project that I'm going to talk about, Te Aramua, Future Streets. And Te Aramua is, um, is the name that uh, Indigenous New Zealanders, Māori, have given to the project. And it's basically um, healthy streets as well. And the, the research is a, a suburban retrofitting intervention study, but it's also a participatory piece of um, co-design with the community. And there's a huge team involved, an amazing kind of cross-disciplinary team, including uh, transport researchers, uh, social scientists, indigenous urban design, um, physical activity researcher Melody Smith, um, and epidemiologists and environmental health researchers. And so I'm going to talk a bit about, so the, the research project is only partway through and we haven't got, I haven't got lots of exciting results to show you. But so what I'm going to talk about is the study design, the intervention co-design, the measures that we're um, using to assess outcomes and some of the baseline results as well as policy impacts so far. 
as well as being a cross-disciplinary research partnership, it's also a partnership between organisations, including universities, um, private research institutes, but the, more importantly, the, uh, the community in which the intervention is happening, uh, the local board of that community, uh, the Māngari Ōtahuhu local board, Auckland Transport, who um, are the regional transport uh, policy makers and, and who build the um, local transport infrastructure, but also the, the national level transport agency who invest in transport at a national level. And then our accident, um, accident compensation corporation who are interested in And the, the funding that's come through that partnership is, you know, about three million New Zealand dollars in terms of research, but about 10 million New Zealand dollars in terms of investing in the infrastructure that, that gets built. And so we've got this kind of research and transport investment partnership, which is pretty unique around the world. So just a bit of background about active transport, so walking and cycling um, in daily trips, which we think is a really good way for people to um, not only build in physical activity regularly into their daily lives without having to pay to the, go to the gym or make particular time during the day to do exercise for its own sake, um, but also is a really good way of um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions because when people uh, change from short car trips to short trips by walking and cycling then they save a whole lot of um, a whole lot of climate pollution as well and it has a number of other benefits in terms of local neighborhood social connection um, reducing road traffic injuries and reducing air pollution as well and what we know from previous research um, is that uh, just encouraging people to do more walking and cycling when their environments are not conducive to that is, is, um, is not particularly effective for long-term change, that we need to create the supportive environments for walking and cycling in people's local areas um, before people are able to make behaviour change. Um, and a little bit of that evidence comes from Think looking at uh, workplace and school travel planning where people have tried to use behaviour change programmes in organisations like schools and workplaces to encourage people to get to work and school um, by walking and cycling. But there have been recently some really exciting natural experiments, um, including in New Zealand, uh, the UK and Australia where um, people have looked at investments that were already going to be made in terms of walking and cycling infrastructure and uh, measured um, changes in walking and cycling as a result of that infrastructure. And as researchers in those natural experiments, we just have to accept whatever that, whatever that um, intervention was going to be and, and wherever the intervention is. Um, and there have been some problems with the, that those study designs, um, self-selection, in other words, people choosing to live in areas where walking and cycling infrastructure is going to be and already wanting to walk and cycle before that intervention happens. Um, really low response rates to, um, to surveys that are sent out to ask about um, walking and cycling behaviour. Mostly subjective measures of walking and cycling. Um, but despite that, those studies have found improvements in um, walkability, for example, access to a range of destinations do result in more walking. And that uh, when, when transport agencies do invest in more walking and cycling infrastructure, some more walking and cycling does, um, does happen, um, but that it take some time for those changes to happen, perhaps two years or more. 
And in our, in New Zealand, we've also, um, there's been a big natural experiment study around what's called the model communities, which have received quite a lot of um, investment in cycling, especially. Um, and they found a kind of an arresting of decline, at least in walking and cycling. Although the infrastructure that, that's that been built in a lot of these studies is pretty uh, low quality, um, sparsely scattered and not particularly joined up in terms of a network. And throughout the presentation, I've got these pictures of the, um, the, the future streets uh, intervention, I guess, and, and design. And as a public health uh, researcher, um, I never, I didn't ever imagine that I would be involved in kind of um, designing things like that diagram down the bottom or drawing up cycling roundabouts and things like that. So I feel like I've got a bit of um, civil engineering expertise now under, under my belt as well as public health research. A bit of the background specifically to um, the Future Streets intervention. So um, it's partly built on this idea of self-explaining roads that really has come out of the Netherlands um, in terms of sustainable safety. So it's kind of initially was focused on um, road traffic injury and reducing road traffic injury. And self-explaining roads are really um, take some psychological principles around the way that the environment affords or um, tells a story to road users about the way they should behave or allows the road users to behave in particular ways. And it says that we need to really rethink a road hierarchy of you know whether whether this road is a through road or a local street and then redesign the um the roads to tell a different story to road users about how they can and should behave and you can see these photos from um, a self-explaining roads pilot study in auckland um, that show how that might work on a local street and when in that pilot study, when um, those street changes were put in place, um, they found that it really was incredibly successful at both lowering speeds and narrowing the range of speeds that were able to, um, especially for vehicles that were able to drive down those streets, with a huge kind of benefit in terms of um, safety, a 40% crash reduction in that area over a couple of years, and a halving of crash costs. But, you know, that was essentially very much a single focused intervention on, on, um, on injury, on road traffic injury, and we were interested in a much more wide range of um, outcomes. It was also based on some work that, some modelling work that I had done previously for my PhD, which was about modelling what if we um, invested in cycling infrastructure in Auckland, could we um, measure and value a wide range, wider range of public health outcomes, including um, cycling injury, deaths and serious injuries, um, physical activity related mortality, greenhouse gas emissions, air quality and um, household fuel cost savings and put that up against the infrastructure costs of investing in that cycling infrastructure. And you can see from this graph that, um, that the biggest, really the headline thing from this graph is that the biggest uh, savings come from reductions in physical, uh, in physical inactivity related mortality. So basically being able to say to transport policy makers that, um, that investing in cycling infrastructure is, is really excellent value for money and that we should shift our understanding of safety in transport to um, safety from physical activity, mortality, inactivity, mortality, safety from climate change, not just safety from injury. Um, and that kind of conversation is starting to have traction amongst policymakers in, in New Zealand. And that there are these, the, the other kind of piece of background to this is that there are these um, systemic injustices in, in cities around the environments for, um, for, 
for active transport especially there are a range of you know transport outcome systemic injustices or inequities for example in road traffic injury in um, in air quality morbidity and mortality uh, and in physical activity um, and obesity and they are both by income and in New Zealand by ethnicity. So um, we know that uh, our indigenous people, Māori, have much higher rates of, um, of all of those negative health outcomes from transport, um, as well as the Pacific people, people who live in New Zealand. And New Zealand has the highest um, population of, of Pacific people in the world in, in Auckland. And so you can see from these two pictures on on the left we have um, we have these two streets that have the same name that are named after beautiful native trees, Puridedi trees that um, attract lots of native birds. And one of them is in a wealthy neighbourhood, Puridedi Avenue in Green Lane. And you can see that there are actually Puridedi in the street and providing shade. There's road narrowing and slowing. Um, in the distance there. So a much more attractive, safe feeling place for walking and cycling. Um, whereas Pūdiri Road in Manu Day high modern no, no trees all set and wide road like it could be um, used like, a, like an airport runway um, with very high traffic speeds and high rates of pedestrian. Um, Pacific people don't cycle. It's just not in their culture. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of digging to find that that, that that's actually a myth. So um, this graph shows um, in the census in New Zealand, we ask people how they got to work on census day, their mode of tra transport to work. And I think that's quite a common question in censuses around the world. Um, and the graph shows um, the trip to work um, by cycling for Māori and Pacific and then non-Māori, non-Pacific. Um, and you can see from this graph that Māori especially cycled a lot more, almost twice as much as everybody else um, in the 1990s. And Pacific people cycled to work um, as much as, as everybody else in the 1990s. So there's something about what happened between then and now that, um, that has led to a really steep decline in cycling. And that's partly about a huge growth in, um, in motor vehicle travel and, um, and cheap, cheap cars. So being able to kind of bust some of these cycling culture myths. So on top of that background, Future Streets had a number of aims. So we had a very strong equity focus. We really wanted to understand what was going to work to increase active transport for short trips for um, Māori and Pacific communities. And we wanted to be able to measure some broader, more integrated effects of retrofitting suburban streets for walking and cycling, not just around safety, but a range of other benefits that I'll come to. And then we want to move from there to being able to model uh, what would happen if you did a similar intervention across a region or at a national level, similar to the kind of modelling that I'd done before for cycling. But also, um, and perhaps most importantly, to demonstrate a more participative process for, um, for transport decision making and investment, especially when we're talking about um, sub the suburbs and how we, how, we improve, how we improve suburbs. And by doing all of those things on the way and afterwards to influence institutional change. So to change the way that policy decision making is made, to change the way that the business case for transport investments um, occurs, so that it includes a wider range of outcomes for public health. Um, and to change the way that transport um, agencies um, work to allow for greater innovation around walking and cycling and greater participation. 
and the project is built on this causal theory, which I'm not expecting you to um, be able to see or understand necessarily, but just to show that um, it's built on a kind of complex dynamic causal theory that links um, short trips walked and cycled in the neighborhood, which is what we're interested in, with, um, with a range of uh, influences and outcomes, but which work in, in kind of feedback ways. So for example, the more short trips that are walked and cycled in the neighborhood, um, the more that, that people are there on the streets and that increases local community social connection, which makes people feel safer from crime, which makes more people more likely to walk and cycle in the neighborhood. So these kind of nice um, reinforcing feedback loops that are quite helpful for, um, for encouraging more walking and cycling by, by changing the neighborhood. And it's a controlled before and after intervention study. So we um, took, we matched to um, two neighborhoods uh, in Auckland, both by um, access to different kinds of destinations, street layout and kind of the age of development and walkability and by demographics, um, ethnicity, income, age distribution. And although these two areas, you can see the photos there, um, Mangari and Mangari East on the right, um, look like they're close together and would suffer from intervention contamination, um, they're actually divided by a motorway. So that there's a lot less movement between those two areas than you might expect. So that big green line that goes down um, divides them and, and that's a motorway. And then we measure, we're, going, we're measuring before and after um, traffic speeds and volumes, um, taking videos of road user behavior, counting pedestrian and cyclist movements. And then we have a big randomized um, resident survey across the two areas about travel mode use for short trips, um, destinations, physical activity, um, subjective, um, reporting of physical activity, uh, neighborhood perceptions of safety um, from crime and from injury, self-reported injuries, um, and that's across children and adults. And then we're also doing some um, objective measures of physical activity and air pollution as well. And then we're going to be able to mon uh, model um, the greenhouse gas emission savings of any shift that we see to walking and cycling. And so the first, um, the baseline survey was completed in 2014, over eight months. And because the census is quite poor for, um, for Mangari, because there's a, quite a lot of um, people who don't want to fill out the census accurately, because they're either, um, they've got Fano who are not meant to be in the country in the household and complicated things like that. We had to enumerate all the households in the area and then used a, a probability of um, to invite people to participate. And we had a much higher response rate than has previously been seen in the natural experiments that I talked about um, and managed to recruit um, to almost 1,250 adults and 650 children. Um, and a good mix of men and women um, amongst the adults and the children. And this is a pretty unique data set worldwide um, because it's a mainly Pacific community. Our participants are, um, are main, the majority of them come from the Pacific. So um, about a third Samoan and Tongan, and then a significant proportion Cook Island, Māori and Nguyen, um, with almost no um, non-Māori, non-Pacific kind of um, New Zealand European population. So for the first time, we're going to be able to analyze um, travel patterns, not just lumping all Pacific people together as though they're all the same, but being able to look by specific um, Pacific ethnicities. And that's a, that's a yeah, pretty unique uh, um, thing to be able to do. But obviously we're not going to be able to look at outcomes uh, like, um, 
thinking about equity. So we're, we're going to be able to analyze what works for Māori and Pacific or doesn't work, but not be able to necessarily compare that with non-Māori, non-Pacific, because we've got such a small group of non-Māori, non-Pacific in, in the population. And this just shows um, the adult travel patterns at baseline. Uh, so you can see that while there's almost no cycling, um, in the adult population, there's already quite a bit of walking for particular reasons. So 30% um, of people had taken a walking trip to an indoor recreation like the pool or something like that, um, or the gym in the last week. And more than that, about 35% had taken a walking trip to outdoor recreation. Most people in the neighbourhood thought that their neighbourhood was already reasonably walkable, um, but less than half thought it was easy to cycle. Um, and two thirds of people in, thought people drove too fast. Um, and while, um, while people mostly felt strongly connected with others in their neighbourhood and safe during the day, about two thirds felt unsafe on their street um, after dark. Uh, and more than half of people didn't think there were safe places for people, for children to go and play. The child travel patterns, about two thirds of children had made at least one walking trip in the last week, um, but very few had cycled anywhere. About um, a third of children walked to school every day already. Um, and a third of children had a bike in working condition, but only a very small proportion of those children were allowed to bike on the street without the supervision of their parents. And we're talking about a neighbourhood where the parents often have uh, two jobs and a working shift work just to pay the bills. So there's not a lot of parental supervision available, especially during the week. This is, these are pictures of the air pollution data. So um, you can, we did this uh, uh, NO2 monitoring using um, basically uh, passive diffusion tubes. So they're collecting data over a period of time. Um, and we had 28 sites in each of the intervention and control areas. So we could look at differences in air pollution at a fine scale. And we were quite worried that air pollution would be pretty much dominated by the motorways that, uh, that you can see there in blue on either side of the intervention area. But actually we found it's a really nice variation. So we should be able to see some differences um, as a result of the intervention. And th this just shows how the video, uh, the, the video data works, um, partly how it works. So this is about, looking at um, cycling and pedestrian and cycling movements um, at a particular part of the intervention area between the town centre. You can see there's a town centre there and a sea of car parks and then a busy road for people to cross. Um, and that was used to understand uh, movements across the whole intervention area so that we could talk with the community about where, where the, where the um, types of uh, changes might happen and what types of changes might be most useful. And once we had the baseline data, we, we then went through a, a participatory intervention design with the community. And this was quite difficult in Māngari to find out where to, where to have meetings and how to have meetings so that people could come to them. And we found that the best things to do were to hold um, weekly stalls at the, um, at the local uh, town centre when, when the big market was on. Um, and that was a really good way of gathering information about where people were already going, where they wanted to go, where they felt safe and unsafe and what they would like to see in terms of changes. And then to bring back draft designs to in the, to the same fora um, and continue to have conversations about how that would be, including conversations about um, what, what the designs would mean for uh, loss of things as well. So especially loss of um, on street parking. And then we also held um, focus groups with, and walk along interviews with, um, with a range of community members, including at the schools and with uh, elders and people with disabilities. 
and then a separate um, process of engagement with uh, the with the uh, indigenous people of that place, um, the the mana whenua of that place, who who also we brought in these um, indigenous design principles and into the into the design of the intervention. And the community came up with these design principles alongside the research team that they wanted a street uh, and street hierarchy that gave greater priority to pedestrians and cyclists with reduced speeds and improved sense of safety. Um, a, a um, particular focus on being able to cross the busy roads uh, with, um, a, and a particular focus on routes to schools and the shopping center. Uh, and that they that they that arterial separated uh, bike lanes were going to be important on the main roads, and they wanted the design of the intervention to really reflect um, the identity, the cultural identity of Mangere people. And that's where these indigenous design principles can come in. So, in we have a um, a strategy. Uh, for indigenous um, landscape design that has a number of principles that could then be incorporated into, a, into our intervention design. And this is a map of the intervention area and just shows how um, the self-explaining roads uh, can work in terms of identifying a, a, a specific road hierarchy for the, for the for the area that includes um, main roads, it includes collector roads, and it includes local roads, all coloured in different colours, and then um, identifying which parts of those streets and how those streets would be um, would look with the intervention. So here are some just some pictures of uh, the intervention when when it was just built. Um, one important thing in this particular area was that there were um, there was potential for routes for walking and cycling through these linear parks that linked cul-de-sacs to destinations like the town centre or the swimming pool um, or the school, but that those linear parks were incredi felt incredibly dangerous and there had been, um, uh, you know, crime and young people um, threatening people in, in the parks because they were secluded. And so, an important part of the intervention was to uh, improve the um, sense of safety in these linear parks and improve the number of people using the parks. So it didn't just end up involving um, transport interventions, but also kind of parks at the council intervening to improve the quality of the services in the parks and planting and lighting and things like that and fencing as, as well. And then a couple of things which are re really um, innovative and that broke the rules, essentially the design rules, business as usual transport design rules. So um, this kind of cycleway that goes up behind the bus stop and comes back down again, um, arterial separated bike lanes. And so as we broke the rules that allowed institutional change. So the design process led to um, better ways of being able to innovate um, despite this kind of uh, quite rigid rule book around, around transport design. Again, breaking the current rules in New Zealand, we um, made, gave um, pedestrians and cyclists priority across all the side roads. So at the moment in New Zealand, um, the car, a car would have priority at the side road turning into the main road. Um, and, the, and, we, and we kind of shifted that around. Um, and we're hoping that that will lead to a law change to make this, this kind of thing standard in design. And then, um, just improving crossings and routes to destinations that were important. And the photo on the right is a set of PO or posts that guide um, walkers and cyclists to particular places of cultural significance, especially the local um, hills that were of cultural um, and historical significance. So just in summary around the project, um, so although there was 
a bit of walking in the community at baseline there was almost no cycling and large um, identified safety barriers to more walking and especially more cycling um, that the street changes that we've made are really a lasting legacy in to the community we've made these physical changes that will last for 50 years and really um, leveraged I guess a, an, an um, invest an investment in that community that hadn't had a, had a kind any kind of community infrastructure investment for a long time and as a, as a kind of um, urban injustice I guess um, but that there are a huge number of challenges to getting the project to where it is at the moment especially um, kind of uh, business as usual inertia in doing innovative street changes, um, a real mismatch between research timelines and transport timelines, um, as well as um, real uncertainty in whether or not the transport agency were gonna come up with um, any significant funding to do the construction. Um, and at the time, um, the political context of the project was one of um, continued investment in new uh, in new motorways as being the focus of, of the transport of transport policy. And then, um, of as where you build um, new cycling infrastructure for the first time, there's a there's a significant barrier of bike flash to get over. And our participatory process, I think, helped to alleviate some of that, but not get rid of it entirely. The first follow-up traffic count and speed measures are already completed, and they show really encouraging expected speed and traffic count reductions, um, as well as increases in pedestrian and cycling counts. And we're currently just completing the first follow-up survey. Um, and we're going to do another, hoping, hoping to get funding to do another, um, another wave of follow-up in, in two years' time. So um, as well as having managed to get this far, um, we've, I think, achieved a really strong kind of community engagement with the project and some institutional changes along the way, including how the transport um, agencies do innovation um, and what kinds of outcomes the, um, are included in the business case for transport investment. But I think there are some really major um, problems with trying to do this research in the current political context. Um, so I've been involved in trying to shift transport policy for about a decade now to improve active transport. Um, and this is the, um, the funding, the transport funding kind of allocation across different, um, different kinds of investment in transport. And you can see that almost all of the transport investment goes to um, new roads, road maintenance and renewal and road policing. And that only about 1% of the transport budget um, in total goes to walking and cycling. And that pretty much hasn't changed over the last decade, despite, uh, despite the best efforts of, um, of researchers and, and activists. And we've got this, we've had over the past decade, this ongoing um, rhetoric about the way that investments in roads, in motorways especially, um, underpin economic growth. Um, and uh, this, this was our previous Prime Minister, I don't, you probably um, don't know those of you on the line, but we've just had a change in government to, um, to a, basically uh, Labour um, and Greens partnership and the, re the rhetoric around transport has already changed significantly and it will be really interesting to see whether they manage to um, rebalance the, the transport investment towards more walking and cycling. But I think a major problem with uh, the, the reason why that investment hasn't changed over time and for those of us who are involved around the world in trying to improve active transport by um, 
by changing the transport investment towards more walking and cycling um, infrastructure. Um, I think we will need to realise that there are um, there is significant profit driven vested interest in transport policy. Um, and in public health, we've already we we already know this story from trying to um, reduce harm from tobacco and the way that um, the tobacco uh, tobacco industries behave in terms of undermining healthy public policy. And we have exactly the same thing in transport policy. So, in New Zealand, those those um, look like uh, big. Um, petroleum industries who have a huge vested interest in increasing car use and increasing um, road freight. Um, a massive vested, profit-driven vested interest by, um, by trucking companies, freight companies, road, road freight companies, um, to pushing for the government to continue to invest in new motorways um, so that they can drive more trucks. And also in from the road construction um, from the road construction industry, and so the, and this is part of what's holding us back, I think, from uh, from a rebalancing of the transport investment for for public health, and it's something that we need to address. I think in the same way that we addressed um, addressed the uh, the tobacco industry. So that's all I was going to say. I'm really happy to take questions and have a conversation about, about the project and about um, the transport policy stuff as well. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. That was a really good presentation. Um, and I think hopefully it's given um, people in the audience a lot to think about. So um, for audience members, please feel free to ask questions um, using the Q&A function. So if you go to the bottom of the screen, you should see a little Q&A box um, to type stuff in there to ask Alex. Um, and while everybody's uh, hopefully starting to type away, um, I was just wondering um, how, which elements you think um, of, the, of the intervention you think would be replicated if you were to do this in similar communities and which elements do you really think were kind of unique to that community in the way that it, it chose to um, set up the design of the streets? Because something, some parts of the intervention, when you look at, very much just look like your standard best practice. But obviously the community was involved in designing them and I don't know how much of them happened to be the best practice being presented to them and how much was the sort of new ideas brought by the community. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And um, it was very, so the design I should have said was very much a triangulation. It wasn't just the community saying what they wanted. It was a triangulation between the community identifying what they wanted and the best evidence from, you know, from the literature and from our experience um, put together with what was possible in terms of policy. Um, and so I think, you know, obviously there are a lot of elements that would look like, oh yeah, that's just a standard, um, a standard separated bike lane. Um, and, and, and that's because that's what the best thing is from the evidence. Um, in terms of what, what could be, what the kinds of things that could be taken and repeated elsewhere, I think there are, um, elements of the process obviously the process itself of co-design um, can be repeated over and over again and it will look diff slightly different in each community there may not be you know a market to hold stalls at or whatever and it may it, it would be um, you have to think about how to engage with, with each ones of those communities and then there's the particular um, you know, finding out where people currently go and where the barriers are really determined how and where the intervention worked in the area. And, and so I think that that process of finding out would need to be done again and again in terms of where people want to go and what's currently not working and what's currently working. And um, the, that the particular kind of linear parks and things in Mangari Central, that's pretty, un, that's pretty unusual for, for an Auckland suburban community. Um, and so, yeah, again, that 
it would be different in each community what what that looked like and then the um and then the the mana whenua involvement and in design would really um also create a different uh cultural landscape I guess in each community too so there are things which there's the process process which could be repeated over and over again there are the elements that are pretty standard looking from best practice as you say and then there are the the the, the how and the where and the cultural landscapes that would be look different in each area and I guess with that um, do you think that sort of the the process potentially for rolling it out would be to sort of extend it to communities next to each other and to start integrating communities that were close by or do you think um, it's more about treating those communities and finding communities I guess that are more either more willing or that are more able um, to, to do this first and then linking them up afterwards I guess what how, how do you think yeah. the best way to yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the strengths of this study is that we is that most of the kind of investments in walking and cycling happen as a, as a response to communities who want it, that self-selection thing. And, and that's not particularly good for equity, because we know that more resourced and well-educated communities um, a, know what would be good and B, uh, have the voice and the resources to demand it. Um, you would want to kind of prioritise communities that aren't necessarily asking for it, but, who, but um, where the benefits would be high. Um, and, you know, there's definitely a commitment, obviously, to, do, to um, intervene in Mangari East, the, in the control area. <laughs> Um, because they've been involved in the study and not really got any any um, benefit out of the study at this point. But I so I think yeah I think joining up joining up communities and creating a bigger area um, would be really important. But also linking it to more network approaches to walking and cycling. So there's a um, there's an Auckland cycling program investment which will be much more focused on on longer routes, so doing whole um, longer routes and um, a couple of those longer routes are kind of connected to the intervention area, which is great to see. So that we're not just gonna be seeing people, um, especially cycling in their, in, just in their neighborhood, but also being able to cycle to destinations further away, like their workplaces or their, um, their, their um, sites of education or other sites of cultural significance. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I guess that it, it also sets me up for um, another one of the questions, which was how how can we as researchers encourage investment in the areas that aren't asking for it and um, that are potentially most at need, but that it's also difficult to show that those communities are most at need, especially in areas where things like participation in the census or whatever else is used um, is low. Yeah, and I think I think one of the really important um, outcomes that's already happened in this project is a shift in prioritisation, especially for, in, for cycling infrastructure um, in that cycling program, um, because cycling because active transport investment has thus far been really um, either quite ad hoc or um, in response to the squeaky wheel, I guess, the communities who are resourced enough to ask for it. Um, and I think that's partly where um, some of the myth busting I talked about. So even just showing that little graph of, you know, um, census cycling over time by ethnicity, you know, that's not something that the transport policy makers had seen or looked at before. Um, and then also showing the kind of health outcomes modeling stuff, which shows that, um, you know, the people who are most likely to benefit, get the greatest benefit out of this infrastructure from a health perspective are 
um, Māori and Pacific communities. So being able to show that and value it and value it so that they can include it in their business cases for investment, that helps with, um, you know, getting higher benefit cost ratios for the transport investment and makes it more likely that that, that investment will go ahead. So I think um, showing health data and showing health equity data is a really important part of um, getting that to happen. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just leave everyone with, um, does anyone else have any more questions? Um, I'm not sure whether people are struggling you, to use their question and answer um, function. Um, but while we leave a little bit of time for anyone else to ask their final burning questions, I'd just like to say thank you again um, for giving this webinar uh, for the Socioeconomic Inequality Special Interest Group and for ISPMPAR as a whole. And um, for anyone that's tuning in that isn't a member of the Special Interest Group, um, feel free to get in touch, uh, send me an email. Uh, we're always very happy to have more members. Um, and also this webinar is being, uh, has been recorded. So hopefully it will be up on the ISPMPAR website soon. Um, so if you have any colleagues that weren't able to tune in today, um, they can always watch the recording later. So I haven't had anything else uh, pop up on my chat. Um, so I think that um, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much again, Alex, um, for tuning in. And thank you everyone for coming and listening to the webinar today. Oh, that was a pleasure. It's good to be here. Thank you.